in honor of the feast that awaits us in just a few days. Today's message is going to be a little meatier than usual. Ironic laughter, yes. You never get a dairy-based message in this church. However, today is more like prime rib or side of ribs, if that's your preference. And so, get out your steak knives, put on your rib bib for today's message on stewarding a life of abundance. Bruce, Gretchen, and Sarah Jacobson moved to Seattle, Washington in 1986. Bruce wanted some Native American art for their home and purchased an antique Chilkat robe. Woven in the late 1800s by native artisans, this six-foot robe hung in their dining room for many years. Daughter Sarah never thought much about it until she saw a similar robe in her high school art history class. Her teacher said it was used in spiritual ceremonies. And Sarah wondered why it was in their house, because her family wasn't Native American. She confronted her dad with terms like cultural appropriation and sacred ceremonial robes and completely inappropriate. Her dad pushed back. After all, he purchased it with his own hard-earned money for a fair price. It was part of their family, part of their home. Sarah didn't back down. So Bruce emailed a picture of the robe to experts at a local museum of Native American artifacts. They replied, We won't tell you what to do. But this is a priceless ceremonial piece owned by an entire clan, passed down from generation to generation, and has monumental cultural significance to these tribes. The Jacobson family had a choice to make a decision about what to do with a priceless treasure. And our reading from John's Gospel have a lot in common. Neuroscientists tell us that our brains are hardwired to think in binary terms. We sort the world into two distinct bins. And you can help me out. Night or up or left or male or black or true or Republican or gay or predator or Evolutionary biologists say this last dualism of predator and prey explains why our brains are hardwired this way. Imagine we've been transported 200,000 years back to the African savanna. We're in a hunting party tracking a herd of antelopes with spears in hand. Suddenly, we hear the roar of a lion behind us. That roar travels simultaneously to two parts of our brain, the amygdala, or emotional part, and the cerebral cortex, or logical part. The emotional part of our brain immediately slaps a bad label to this roar and has set our feet to running even before the logical part of our brain has identified the roar as a lion's and long before we've had a conscious thought 
or conscious feeling. The pre-rational, nonverbal, emotional part of our brain saved our ancestors' lives and was passed down to us to immediately sort experiences into one of two bends. This evolutionary adaptation helped our species survive. Yet it presents challenges for us today, particularly given our divisive socio-cultural political context. I know, I had to pause there. Such black or white thinking excludes the possibility of grays, of a middle ground, of making good, nuanced decisions in a complex world. The second is that pairs of opposites almost always have a value judgment attached to them of good, bad, or right, wrong. Think about the different valuations between white black, or male, female, or gay, straight, or Republican, Democrat in our culture today. The third challenge with binary thinking is that since it's a pre-rational emotional and immediate response, it leads us to make snap judgments and hurts our ability to identify empathetically with people in the other bin. How are we doing so far? Okay. However, this is an important however, we are not doomed to racial, gender, sexuality, or political polarization, despite current cultural trends. The archaic, instinctual, nonverbal, and pre rational part of our brain doesn't have to have the last word. The cerebral cortex or logical part of our brain can dialogue with the amygdala or emotional part of our brain and modulate its reactivity. When that emotional energy hasn't set our feet to running from the lion, <laughs> it can be harnessed for positive change. We might recall we have a patented lion killer strategy and with our fellow hunters who turn and face the predator with deadly spears. While there are downsides to binary thinking, the potential upside is that by holding these polarities in a creative tension, a third option can emerge. Binary thinking can be a springboard to a third option with the strength of our heart and wisdom of our mind. An unforeseen third option can emerge from this dialogue and lead to unexpected progress. While our brains may be hardwired for binary thinking, we can outthink our brains and lead to third option advancements. I know, it sounds rather conundrumish. I know. How are we doing so far? God knows all about binary thinking. As creator, God gave us the brains we have. As the Lord of time, God understands that millions of years of evolution have shaped our brains. 
as Christians, we believe that God took on flesh in the person of Jesus who had a brain just like ours. God knows our brains inside and out and is intimately acquainted with binary thinking. In John's gospel, Jesus encounters binary thinking and then explodes those categories, leading to a third option none had considered. Jesus wants to move us from binary thinking to a more creative option. For instance, Jesus meets a woman at the well in Samaria and asks her for a drink of water. She replies, how is it that you, a Jew, Ask a drink of me, a woman from Samaria. Jews don't share things in common with Samaritans. She continues, Our ancestors worshiped God on Mount Gerizim, but you Jews worship in Jerusalem. Separate countries, separate cups, and separate temples in one of two bins. What does Jesus say? The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth. A third option, one never before considered, is offered by Jesus. Jesus and his disciples encounter a man born blind. They ask, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus' third option reply is, Neither. He was born blind that God's works might be revealed in him. Probably the most mind blowing statement of Jesus is when he says, The Father and I are one. Every Jew prayed daily Hear, O Israel. The Lord is God. The Lord is one. God dwells in the heavens. And here's a fellow Jew saying that he and God are one. What? And that's not even mentioning (laughs) the Holy Spirit. Talk about unconsidered third option thinking. God knows all about binary thinking, understands our brains from the inside out, and wants us to consider unconsidered third options. Jesus wants us to move from binary thinking to a more creative option. Good? All right. Binary thinking hobbles our efforts at being good stewards. If we're trapped in dualistic thought processes, then being conduits of blessing as God intends becomes difficult. If we polarize our giving habits, we miss out on the more creative stewardship that God intends. One area impacting stewardship is how we understand creation. Biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann wrote in 1999, the conflict between the narratives of abundance and scarcity is the defining problem confronting us at the turn of the millennium. We are torn apart by the conflict between our attraction to the good news of God's abundance and the power of our belief in scarcity. A belief that makes us greedy, mean, 
and unneighborly. We spend our lives trying to sort out that ambiguity and must decide where our trust is placed. Creation is the realm of God's abundance. Yet humans introduce the idol of scarcity of not enough and never enough. At the outset of creation, God says, be fruitful and multiply. In the scarcity of the wilderness, God provides plentiful manna for 40 years. In the scarcity of the wilderness, Jesus multiplies five loaves and two fish and feeds 5,000 with 12 baskets of leftovers. God's continually reminding people that abundance is true because the siren song of scarcity is so tempting. Jesus does it in today's reading, saying a grain of wheat must die in order to bear much fruit. How much? Two bushels of single wheat grains dropped one at a time onto an acre field yields 45 bushels, enough for 2,500 loaves of bread. Extraordinary abundance. Yet the lie of scarcity keeps us fearful. Others with less may take what I have. Greedy. I need to hoard just in case. And anxious. I'll never have enough. We're torn between the good news of God's abundance and the lie of scarcity. We'd like to think the way to resolve this dilemma is to live from the abundance side, right? The problem, according to author Brene Brown, is that abundance and scarcity are two sides of the same coin. Scarcity and abundance work together as a positive feedback loop, driving an ever-increasing frenzy for more and widening the chasm between the haves and the have-nots. According to Brown, the opposite of never enough isn't abundance or more than you can imagine. The opposite of scarcity is enough. What she calls wholeheartedness or vulnerability or worthiness. Enough is the third option that breaks the feedback loop, driving our fearful acquisitiveness and anxious hoarding. The Bible understands the danger of scarcity and abundance. As Proverbs 30 verse 8 says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food I need. When we understand that we truly have enough and that our enough is in actuality an abundance, we can be generous. Knowing we have enough can free us from the destructive dualistic thinking of scarcity and abundance, opening us to be conduits of blessing as God intends. Our understanding of creation impacts our giving habits. How are we doing?
Okay. Dualistic thinking is also problematic when we consider our role in creation. What does it mean to be a responsible human being on this planet? How we understand our creaturely responsibility impacts our giving habits, and binary thinking hobbles that. Show of hands. <laughs> How many of us have ever been a passenger in a rental car? The driver hits a teeth-chattering pothole, sees our concerned face, and says, Don't worry, it's a rental. People treat rental cars in ways they never do. A car they owned. And people treat rental properties similarly. They have a renter's mindset that includes carelessness toward the property of others. The landlord will fix it. Low commitment because of looking for the next and better deal. Short timers that are passing through without engaging others. Doing the bare minimum to maintain a livable space without improving it. Given how we are caring for creation, one could argue we treat this world as renters. But there is a better way. That better way is to be an owner, which has a very different mindset, including care for the property I possess and I therefore must fix. High obligation because we're committed to where we are. Long timers that are invested in a particular place, upkeep and improving our space is required through HOA mandates. Ownership is a bedrock of dem democratic societies and homeowners get tax benefits that renters don't. Clearly, the better way to treat creation is to be an owner rather than renter. If all were owners, then the problems of renters would be solved. Yet ownership creates its own problems. The major problem with ownership is when it becomes a sense of entitlement. Most owners take good care of their homes, whether because of internal pride, external pressure from neighbors, or wanting to maintain or increase property value. So far, so good. The problem arises when we consider public lands, ones that everyone owns, like local, state, and national parks or interstates. If we've ever ridden with someone that tossed a plastic bag of soda cans and burger wrappers out the window, and they saw our concerned face, they'd say, don't worry, it's public land. I'm an owner, and I'll do as I please. Ownership can lead to entitlement. People treat public lands in ways they'd never do their own property. Renting and owning both have deficiencies when it comes to a responsible role in creation. Scripture offers a third option beyond the dualistic renter or owner choice, that of being a steward. Stewardship comes from medieval England when lords owned all the land, farms, buildings, and commerce in their realms. The steward didn't own anything but took care of everything of the Lord's. He managed crop rotations, the labor force, taxes, banking, commerce, and any of the Lord's other interests. The Lord is the owner. And the steward is the manager, whom the Lord holds accountable for their management. The difference between ownership and stewardship can be simply demonstrated. If I handed you a $100 bill 
and ask you to give it to someone else, you'd easily do it because you have no rights over it. However, if I asked you to reach into your wallet and pull out whatever cash you had and give it to someone else, uh, there'd likely be some hesitation. (laughs) Because as the owner of that cash, you have the right to transfer it how you see fit. While owners have rights, stewards do not but they are responsible to manage well the resources entrusted them by their Lord. Steward is the third option that can free us from the destructive, dualistic thinking of renter or owner, opening us to be conduits of blessing as God intends understanding our role in creation as stewards frees us to be generous to others with what the Lord has given us. All right. Heading into the home stretch. All right. Dualistic thinking is also problematic when we consider our understanding of time. Time's meaning impacts our giving habits. The Greek language has different types of time. Most of the world lives in secular, temporal, quantitative, chronos time. Chronos is tick-tock time. The steady beat of a metronome. Empty meaningless, changeless, and operates irrespective of humans. This is chronos. But there's more to time than the span between our first and last breath. We know that time was there before us that time continues after us and there's more to time than our limited lifetime. The Greek for this is ion or eternal, sacred, unending time. Ion is endless, everlasting, timeless, the fulfillment of human desire, hope, and meaning. Jesus contrasts these two understandings of time, saying, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. Kronos is not where to store our treasures. But in Ion, where there aren't moths, rust, or thieves, Kronos is temporal, while Ion is eternal. How do we store up such treasures? Or better yet, when do we store up such treasures? That's where the third option comes into play. When heaven's desires and earth's circumstances align perfectly. The Greeks call this kairos, or qualitative, opportune, or the appointed time. Kairos measures moments, not seconds. And such moments are crucial junctures in time, ripe with possibility. Ecclesiastes 3 1 says, To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. That's Kairos. Paul says, When the fullness of time had come, 
God sent his son, born of woman, born under the law. At the appointed time when Jesus began his ministry, he preached, the kairos is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. It's when Ion's eternity burst into Kronos's temporality that Kairos's timeliness is revealed. Kairos cannot be scheduled or forced, but only prepared for by paying attention with patient expectancy and trust. Jesus tells us to understand the signs of the times and to keep alert, watch, and pray. By positioning ourselves to act with mercy and justice in a timely manner, we can be attentive and receptive to Kairos. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the time is always right to do what's right. By doing the right things, we open ourselves into entering into the right time of Kairos. Kairos is the third option that can free us from the dualistic thinking of temporality or eternity, opening us up to be conduits of blessing as God intends. Time's proper understanding means we can store up treasures for ourselves in heaven by acting today with mercy and justice. Kairos frees us to be timely participants in heaven's desires for earth's circumstances. Bruce Jacobson, the owner of the Chilkat Robe, had at the prodding of his daughter Sarah come to a fork in the road. He knew he wasn't a renter of the robe, for he paid good money for it. It was his, adorning his family's dining room wall for many years. By contacting the museum, he'd reached a new understanding of his relationship with this robe. No longer an owner, but a steward, a caretaker for something that belongs to someone else. Before knowing its true significance, he couldn't imagine his home without it. Had a thief come in and stolen it off the wall, its loss would have been incalculable. After all, a similar robe, although damaged, had been put on eBay in 2015 and could have fetched a price of $30,000. Good condition robes like Jacobson had could command prices of $50,000 dollars or more. George Blucher, the owner of the damaged robe that was put on eBay, listed it for $14,500, the lowest bid he'd accept for it, knowing it could bring in twice that. When the Selaska Heritage Institute in Juneau, Alaska, saw it on eBay, they begged him to take it off the auction and promised they'd come up with the $14,500. He took it off eBay and sold it to them, taking a loss of $15,000 or more. Jacobson knew all this, of course, in his own deliberations about what to do with his mint condition robe. Should he ask its full worth of $50,000 for 
from the Selaska Heritage Institute or sell it for half, like Blucher had done. An abundance of cash could soon be theirs. 25000 possibly even 50000 or more. It could help offset Sarah's college cost. Maybe even put away some for retirement. The dining room wall would sure look bare without it. The scarcity of its possible absence from their home might not offset the abundance of cash that could possibly be theirs, however. Bruce, by wrestling through the struggles and possibilities of abundance and scarcity, came to a new understanding of enough. Perhaps he and his family had enjoyed the beauty of this robe long enough on their own. Their enough was in actuality in abundance as they'd enjoyed this robe every day for 21 years in their home. Perhaps others might enjoy its beauty too. Wrestling with this robe's meaning and significance had mediated a new understanding of creation to Bruce. Perhaps he wouldn't be impoverished by its absence in his home, but enriched by its possible presence at a new home at the Selaska Heritage Institute, dedicated to perpetuate, enhance, and share the Pacific Northwest Native American cultures. <laughs> 